This uh, art committee was comprised of four people, um, the three of us, including uh, Dean Tuttle. It took us months to gather the photos and biographic information that we have at this conference. We did this uh, through a lot of hard work and friends across the country. In addition to the four of us, we had help from many people, among them uh, Rick Welsh, Karen Wolf, Pete Wurzberger, um, and Greg Goodrich. We're very thankful to you. Thankful <coughs> to uh, Sharon, Denise, and Lauren, and other people at the National Office. This session and this part of the conference, we're here to recognize heroes and pioneers in blindness rehabilitation and education. Heroes are people who are admired for their great courage. And pioneers are those who are responsible for originating new thoughts and new line of thinking. We recognize these heroic pioneers with this special session. The parade of pioneers is a process that I don't think will ever be complete. The numbers will continually increase. This parade, ladies and gentlemen, we cannot all be in the parade, according to Will Rogers, and some of us have to sit on the curb and applaud. <laughs> Join us today as we sit on the curb and applaud the pioneer, the parade of the pioneers. Among those individuals that we're featuring in our parade of pioneers is Dr. Douglas Inkster. Doug lived from 1925 to 93, born and buried in his beloved Michigan. He married a high school sweetheart, Wilma, and they've had three children. After World War II, when Doug was, was wounded, came back to the United States and completed a bachelor's degree in Florida and a master's degree in counseling and testing and a doctorate at Michigan State University. He, he served in many capacities in his illustrious career, and each, each position, if you knew his complete biography, you could see would be a piece of music to complete a symphony. He worked as a rehabilitation counselor for the Michigan Rehabilitation Association, then as an assistant regional director uh, with Rehabilitation Services Administration. He served as the, one of the first assistant directors of the National Accreditation Association and was responsible for crafting some of the early criteria that evolved into NAC. He worked for a time at the Foundation for Blind Children and then moved to the pinnacle of his career, as many of you know, as executive director for the Center of Independent Living in New York City, where he served proudly and honorably from 1972 to 1985. Doug was, he was cool about older blind adjustment services before it was cool. Many of us today who work in this field of older blindness remember his precepts. He, his expertise was really, truly in rehabilitation administration program development and evaluation. He served proudly as a consultant nationally. He served with CARP and NAC and did many reviews. Doug, uh, Doug as a person was a quiet, self-assured individual that just simply got the job done. He never beat his own chest, he never sang his own song, but he made everyone around him succeed. Another hero is Bertho Bollinger, who was uh, born in, in Austria and lived from 1901 to his death in California in 1994. He received 
received his doctorate in psychology from the University of Vienna in 1927. While he was a doctoral student, he began teaching at the Jewish School for the Blind in 1922. In 1931, he received a Rockefeller scholarship that brought him to the United States to uh, study education of blind children. He moved back permanently to the U.S. in 1938 to work at the New York Institute for the Blind, a residential school in the Bronx. Robert Irwin offered him a position that led him to a full-time position as research director at AFB in uh, 1939, where he served to 1949, and he investigated the new idea about talking books. Uh, he also was prolific in landmark investigations in preschool blind and education of blind children. While he was in New York, he uh, taught at Columbia in the school, uh, teaching education classes at Columbia University. He moved to California and served as superintendent of the School for the Blind from 1949 to 1963. He had the amazing idea at the time that if kids received a proper evaluation, the placement will evolve into itself. Among his 100 professional articles and book chapters, two of his famous books, Blind Children, one of my personal favorites, Changing Status of the Blind in the United States. Lowenfeld was prolific, he was articulate, and charismatic. If you were in his presence, you knew it. He commanded attention just by being here. An additional hero is Alice Geisler Raftery, who was born in, uh, born in Michigan on September 2nd, 1927, and still lives in Michigan. Alice received a bachelor's degree and a master's degree from Mary Grove College in Detroit. And she did post-master's work at Wayne State University in ophthalmology and in the hospital. Alice and her husband Ray just celebrated their 50th anniversary a few months ago, surrounded by love from their eight children and 17 grandchildren. One of the amazing stories about Alice that people don't know is she began her career in rehabilitation teaching at age 40. I shudder to think what would happen to the field if she was started when she was 25. <laughs> <laughs> she, began, she began her career as a rehabilitation teacher and spent most of her working life at what was then the Greater Detroit Society for the Blind between 19 68 and 1993. She began as a rehabilitation teacher, progressed up the ladder to field supervisor, and then to assistant, uh, excuse me, associate executive director. She has, is responsible for many publications and videos and training. Those of you that, that know her, she has been a tireless advocate for professionalization of rehabilitation teaching and a tireless advocate for the people that the people we serve deserve quality services. Sometimes it's difficult to say if she's a professional or an advocate because she lives in the souls and the shoes of the consumers that we serve. Those of us that love her as I do call her mama. Other individuals that are in our parade of heroes are Georgia Lee Abel, San Francisco State University, Sam Ashcroft, George Peabody College, Robert Atkinson, Braille Institute, Donald Blosch, Western Michigan University, Father Thomas Carroll, Carroll Center, Massachusetts, Cleo Dolan, Cleveland Society for the Blind, Catherine Gruber, American Foundation for the Blind. Good morning. 
My name is Rod. I'm from the government. <laughs> and I'm here to help you. <laughs> I just had to share that line with you because it's one that's become my trademark in Wisconsin. We often do what we call a view, visual impairment education in Wisconsin. And that involves getting together rehabilitation teachers, mobility instructors, low vision, all the things that people might need. And we do a two or three day intensive training with them. And for many people, it's their first time as going somewhere publicly as a blind or a very person. And they have a lot of feelings about doing that and sitting down in a room full of blind people. So that opener has broken the ice and got us on a first-name basis off to a fast start. This presentation has really been an interesting and challenging project. I can't think of anything that has been more difficult than more demanding. In fact, this makes the Vietnam project look easy. The others that have worked on this, you know, and I especially want to thank them. There are many others, particularly Naomi and Dean Tauta. Uh, they have spent months doing the research and gathering the bios, putting them together. Uh, a lot of homework. Uh, in fact, uh, their long distance carrier, you know, when you get points, and uh, maybe you can use your phone a lot. Well, Dean tells me that uh, their long distance carrier tells me they have just about enough points for the Mercedes. <laughs> <laughs> Richard Hoover is a person who is credited with developing the long cane technique and how to use that cane. He later became an ophthalmologist in practice in Baltimore, Maryland, many of us are familiar with him. Samuel Bridley Howe is somebody that we all recognize, a tremendous educator, philosopher, writer. He established prisons in the first training in the United States. Robert Irwin is another name that we recognize. This is a person who did a lot of writing and addressed some of the attitudes around blindness. And he was with the American Foundation for the Blind in its early years for a long time. Kenneth Jernigan is a name that we all recognize. He was an individual who felt very strongly about advocacy and rights for blind persons and true access to all strata of society. <coughs> Those of us who are familiar with his speeches and his writings know, excuse me, know that he worked very hard uh, to accomplish those goals. Helen Keller. To talk of her accomplishments would take the rest of the day, of course. deaf-blind person who became educated and lectured at universities throughout the world and was associated with the American Foundation for the Blind. Roy Compe is a person who many of us know and remember. He established the Lions Training Program in Arkansas and I think brought a new development in terms of rehabilitation services for blind persons, particularly adjustment centers, and also uh, the vocational training programs we established. Derwood McDaniel is a person that many of us recognize. He was an attorney, an advocate for blind persons, services for the blind, and the rights of individuals to live freely in society as they choose. He was also the president of the American Council for the Blind for many years. He 
The next person I want to mention is Natalie Berrida. This is a person that many of us know and love, and I'm really uh, honored to be able to present her accomplishments in bio today. Natalie was born in Texas, and she has degrees from North Texas, University of Texas, and a doctoral degree from Peabody College of Vanderbilt. Natalie began her career in education by teaching home economics in the public schools. While in New York for her daughter's corrective orthopedic braces, she taught kindergarten for two and a half years at the New York Institute for the Blind. When she returned to Texas, she took a position as home economics teacher at the Texas School for the Blind. Beginning in 1963, she had accepted an appointment to the special education faculty at the University of Texas, Austin. In 1984, she retired from the University of Texas, but that was only from UT. And she remains working very hard in the field, and specifically, I think, in terms of education of blind children, and especially low vision for blind children. I think she was advocating for low vision at a time when low vision students didn't benefit from Bush or Shove, and they needed a advocate. And Natalie did a lot to bring them to the forefront across the country. She's had membership and organizations from a number of groups, Phi Kappa Phi, Alpha Chi, Kappa Delta Pi, Pi Lambda Theta, Delta Kappa Gamma, American Academy of Optometry, Council for Exceptional Children, Association for Education and Rehabilitation in Blind and Vision Impaired, and International Council of Education for Vision Impaired. She has also received honors for many of her writings and she has lectured overseas and has a biography that would stretch us into tomorrow. Another individual that we want to honor today is Ruth Carvalho. Excuse me. We think of Ruth Carvalho as the person who brought rehabilitation and teaching into a profession. She established the program at Western Michigan University, set up the curriculum, did a lot of writing, and established the framework for professionalization of rehabilitation and teaching. The other two people I want to mention today are two giants in the field that I've had the opportunity to know well and spend some time with them. And in fact, I recently spent some time with both of them and I was able to capture that on video. And while we have a few hours of video, we're only going to see just a few seconds of, of that. I think we could look at that first video now. He was instrumental in the 
number of years in the federal office where he served as a consultant to Mary Switzer, and through his efforts, millions and millions of dollars were directed into lunch programs, especially those in the university training programs for the professions. There is so much that I would like to say about Warren Wetzel. I couldn't begin to get it all in. We often think of him as the godfather, and he certainly is. Uh, any part of blindness that you care to think about, we can remember him as godfather. Uh, particularly, I think of him as a mentor, and through the years, he was always there and a great help. And sometimes that help was, Rod, you need to think about that. Russell Williams was part of that group that started the Heinz program. And of course, the Heinz program was the cradle of rehabilitation for the blind as we practice it today. What they developed at Heinz was a program that was a leap far ahead of blind rehabilitation center programs. I recently talked to Russ at an unknown location in northern Minnesota. Let's take a look at that.
Peter Salmon of the New York Administrator of the Industrial Home for the Blind, Stan Saturco of Michigan, Mobility Pioneer, Mary Switzer, District of Columbia, Rehabilitation Services Administration Commissioner, Joe Taylor of New Jersey, Educator of Visually Handicapped Children, Lou Baselli of Illinois, Job Placement Educator, Don Wetterer of Florida, State Director of Florida Division of Blind Services, Bob Whitstock of New Jersey, Administrator of the CNI. I want to tell you a little bit about Edward Edmund Albert Baker, who was born in Ernestown, Ontario, Canada, at Parrots Bay in 19, 1893. He received his Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from Queen's University in 1914, and soon afterwards joined the Army in the 6th Field Company Canadian Engineers, quickly rising to the rank of captain. While fighting in the trenches in Flanders, surrounded by Germans, a sniper's bullet came from the side, and he would never see again. He was the first Canadian officer to lose his sight during World War I. He received the Military Cross and the Croix de Guerre from France for his service. After a lengthy stay in the hospital in England, he met Sir Arthur Peterson, founder of St. Dunstan's Hospital for the Blind. Pearson gave him a braille watch for the first time, and Baker felt some independence. That pocket watch was still running when he died 50 years later. He worked hard on his training and rehabilitation in St. Dunstan's, and even took up fencing. In 1916, he returned to Canada, only to find the rehab services for blind and visually impaired people, primarily veterans was his interest at that time, were very few. The primary uh, service available was in Toronto, a small rail library. In 1918, the Canadian National Institute for the Blind was founded by Lieutenant Colonel Baker and six other blind and visually impaired Canadians. Colonel Baker was the Institute's managing director from 1920 to 1962. Under his leadership, CIB began to gather information about blind and visually impaired people in Canada which ultimately resulted in a list of prominent men and women from the United States and Canada, both blind and sighted, who are not the kind of people who pass among us unnoticed. They were and are the kind of people who lived and thought ahead of their time. Each time they tried something, each time they invented an idea, and perhaps even failed, our profession advanced in practice and in philosophy. Their lives and their achievement give us an inspiration in the dawn of the 21st century. This is not an exhaustive list. It never will be. If your personal hero wasn't included, we beg your forgiveness, but the uh, program committee wouldn't allow us to take the entire conference to talk about heroes. The biographies and uh, the pictures, as you've noticed, are out in the halls. The biographies in both print and braille are at the Colorado desk if you would like to review them. We hope that you want to replicate this at your state chapter or uh, provincial chapter meetings. Uh, as uh, Sharon has told you, the pictures and the biographies will be at the central office in Alexandria. I'd like to help me close this presentation by recognizing uh, pioneers who were able to be with us today. Uh, I also want to ask the daughter of one of our pioneers who's with us today. I'd like to ask Doug Engster's daughter, Connie, to stand up. Dr. Natalie Barrett, would you stand up?
not forget the history. It should be part of every personnel preparation program across the United States and Canada. We cannot forget our heroes, our pioneers, and our legends. Thank you so much.